Well, we're going to be looking at uh, verses 4 through 9 in 2 Peter chapter 2. Let's begin reading together at verse 4. I'll read to verse 9. We'll get into our study, and I chose to entitle it, The Lord Knows How to Deliver. Beginning at verse 4, For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell, deliver them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to destruction, making them an example to those who afterward would live ungodly, and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed with the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and how to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Now, as we've been looking at 2 Peter, remind yourself with me that verses 1 through 3 were a portion of his letter where he begins to warn the church against the infiltration of false teachers. He had made it very clear that they would infiltrate and they would bring in destructive error into the church. And this destructive error that the false teachers were bringing in that would undermine the gospel related to things like the cross of, of Jesus Christ and its significance and and they began to influence many people and they caused the gospel to come into disrepute, to be, to be ridiculed. He, he says in verse 2, by them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. That word blaspheme means to be reviled or to be spoken against, to be railed against. You see, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And because he is the way, the truth, and the, and the life, his teachings are called the way of truth. And these teachings, the way of truth, are intended to, to transform lives. When somebody not only hears the way of truth, but believes and begins to act upon those things that Jesus taught. In 3 John, in verse 3, John said, I rejoice greatly when brethren came and testified of the truth that is in you, just as you walk in the truth. So it's not a matter of just receiving it. It's a matter of receiving, believing, and acting upon that transforms your life. And so Jesus, being the one who gives to us the truth because he is the truth, is going to have those who introduce error in order that they might undermine his gospel message in our life and destroy the way that we live. Well, he said in verse 3 that they're not going to get away with this because he says their judgment has not been idle. Just because God had not moved to judge them does not mean that he's not going to move and that he's not going to judge. In Romans chapter 2, verses 5 and 6 from the New Living Translation, we read, but because you are stubborn and refuse to turn from your sin, you are storing up terrible punishment for yourself. For a day of anger is coming when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will judge everyone according to what they have done. And so they're going to receive the wages of their sin. Their judgment, he is saying, is sure. Now, to develop this, he's now pointing out that Scripture contains three examples of God bringing judgment. He refers to God judging angels, God judging the ancient world, and then he speaks of the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. We'll look at those things one at a time, some a little bit more than others. The first, notice with me, he speaks in verse 4, God did not spare the angels who sinned. He cast them down to hell. And so he begins to speak concerning the divine judgment that fell upon fallen angels. He's saying if God judged angels, he most certainly will judge sinful man. And he mentions these angels. These angels he refers to as those who sinned. He doesn't identify them for us, but they're undoubtedly the same angels that are mentioned in the book of Jude, verse 6. These are angels who did not keep their first estate. These are angels who rebelled and were ultimately placed into a holding tank, if you will. They're reserved right now for judgment. These are terrible angels that fell with, with Lucifer when he rebelled against God and five times said, I will, meaning that he was taking his will and usurping the authority and will of God. And as a result of that, he was cast out of heaven and he is now referred to as the slanderer, devil. He's the adversary. He's Satan. He has influenced angels 
and there are angels who've been influenced by him that, that Peter and Jude refer to who are being held in a holding cell, if you will. He said he cast them down to hell and delivered them to chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And so they're in a temporary holding cell, but ultimately they'll be placed in the final judgment, is what he's saying. And he's saying that these mighty angels were dealt with by a mighty God and that God's judgment is for sure. If he judges angels, he'll judge the false teachers. Now, this judgment is when both the angels and even men will receive their eternal doom. In Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it says, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are. They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. He goes on in verse 15 of Revelation 20 to say, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And so this judgment is sure. It came upon the angels. They're being reserved right now, but they ultimately will be placed into their final doom, their final destiny. Not only will they be there with the beast and, 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 and the false prophet, but they will also be there with Satan. They will be there with all who reject the Lord God. It's a place that is called the lake of fire. So one, he's saying God's judgment is sure on fallen angels. But two, he gives a second example of certain judgment, and that is the example of what was called the great flood. Now, notice in verse 5, he says, and did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So one, God's judgment is sure because he judges angels. But two, God also judges man. He judges the ungodly. He uses the example of the great flood that occurred during the time of Noah. And I want you to notice that he speaks of the eight who were saved. That would be Noah. That would be Mrs. Noah. That would be the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And it would be their three wives. And that's why he gives the number eight, because he's including the family of Noah. And these people were protected by God when he brought judgment on the world. Now, why did God bring judgment on the world? Genesis chapter 6 tells us, in the Old Testament book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 6 informs us that the world had become wicked. That word wicked there is also translated perverted or perverse, terribly evil, corrupt, and had become violent. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 5 and 6, it says, The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. In verses 11 through 13, it says, The earth was also corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. God said to, to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. It's wicked. It's evil. It's corrupt. And it is violent. And God says, I will bring judgment on the earth. When you look at the conditions of the earth then, you can see similarities in even our days, and I'll point that in just a moment. But in the midst of all of that, God saved Noah. Because according to Genesis chapter 6, verse 8, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That's the first time the word grace is found in your Bible. It's when Noah found grace in the eyes of God. He was in the midst of an evil generation. But in the midst of the evil of that generation, he was saved by the grace of God. And... Though it was wicked, though it was violent, though it was corrupt, though the thoughts and intents of the human heart were only wicked continually, there was a man in the midst of all of that who walked with God, a man who found grace in the sight of the Lord. His name was Noah. Jesus spoke concerning that because he was saying that even as in the days of Noah, so it would be just before he returns. In Matthew 24, 37 through 39, it says, As the days of Noah were, so also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying, giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will be the coming of the Son of Man be. 
You see, like Noah, we are also by grace preserved by the Lord in the evil day that we live in. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, it says, God didn't appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Noah lived in a very extremely corrupt time. But he's referred to, and I want you to see this, he's referred to as being a preacher of righteousness. A preacher of righteousness. That has to be spoken of for just a moment because a lot of people today don't understand what that really means. Even people in church don't understand what it means. That somebody actually is a preacher of righteousness. He's a preacher who speaks concerning the righteousness that is of God and a preacher who is speaking concerning how a man or a woman may become righteous to stand before God so that they don't enter into judgment. And Noah was what is referred to as, as, as a preacher of righteousness. He spoke what God had given to him to speak. And he did it because that's what preaching of righteousness really is. God has called us as ministers of the gospel to be willing to stand up and be counted for what we believe. Now, it's not just that we give our opinions, because a lot of people will say that, oh, you're giving your opinion. I remember in our very, I believe it was our sec second Christmas, may have been our first Christmas, it was the first Christmas service that we had. It was actually at a house. And then we had a Christmas Day service in a church building. But I remember reading through the Christmas story, sharing some things and relating some things um, to just living for Christ and, and, and how we can do that. And at the end of uh, that service, somebody who had been invited by a friend approached me and took issue with me and got upset thought that I was pointing some things out about her personal faith. She was under conviction. She just didn't realize it. So she just got angry at me. You know, she's going to shoot the messenger. And so I remember when she approached me and began to speak to me about it, I said, no, this is what it says. And this is what the Bible says. And, and she said to me something to the effect of, well, that's your opinion. You have opinions and I have opinions. And I smiled at her and I said, and she said, and our opinions are equal. And I said, that's where you're wrong. I said, your opinion isn't equal to mine because you don't even pick up the Bible to read it as a hobby. I study it and I teach it and I've been doing it for years. So for you to equate your opinion with mine is incorrect. What you have is an opinion. What I have is a well-reasoned answer. And there's a difference between the two. But today in our society, this was 31 years ago, today in our society, people still think like that, and even more so today. People who never pick up the Bible will argue with you about what it means and what it says and, and how to understand it. People who have never read a Bible verse and wouldn't know a Bible verse from a poetry, you know, verse of poetry will argue with you. People will say things like, well, God helps those who help themselves. It's got to be somewhere in the Bible, isn't it? Because they really don't understand. And so you ask them, who's the strongest person in the Bible? And they'll say, Hercules. And you'll say, no, I'm sorry, he's not found in the Bible. And so this does happen, you know, this does occur, where people will argue. And see, and they argued at, during the time of Noah. Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was saying to the world, it is corrupt, it is evil, it is perverse, it is doomed for destruction. He didn't say it because that came out of his own heart. He said that because he's a preacher of righteousness. He spoke the words that God gave for him to speak. The prophet Jeremiah in chapter 1, verse 9, it says, the, the, the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. And that speaks of being a preacher of righteousness. It's not that he gives his own opinion. He's giving well-founded words that came from God himself. And and that's what Noah would do. Noah spoke forth the word of God, the mind of God to the people, that they might repent and, and turn and be saved. He preached judgment. And he preached judgment that was to come, though nobody listened. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, it says, The Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. I'm giving you 120 years. Amend your ways. 120 years, Noah preached righteousness. And in the end, the only ones who were saved 
as his family, his wife, his sons, and daughters-in-law. They were the only ones who entered into the ark when God closed the door and nobody else could enter in and judgment came. God destroyed the earth with the judgment of the flood. This is a man who lived a life of a witness, a witness against the immorality of the day. He remained faithful in the midst of it. It says in Hebrews eleven seven, 7, by faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet to be seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. So as Noah was moved through faith and fear, even so should we too to the saving of others. See, the point he's making is if God didn't spare the ancient world in the days of Noah, how much less could he be expected to spare the false teachers in Peter's day or even in our day? So God moves in judgment. God judged the angel. God judged the earth. And then he comes to verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them to, to destruction, making them an example to those who after, afterward would live ungodly and delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed with the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Now he's speaking concerning Sodom and Gomorrah, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. These cities are proverbial for their evil and are mentioned often in Scripture as warnings. Now, when you think of Sodom and Gomorrah, more than likely you normally think of, of one sin that is associated with Sodom and Gomorrah. But there was more than one sin. You may also only think of Sodom and Gomorrah, two cities, when in reality there were five cities that were judged. According to Genesis chapter 14, verse 2, God judged Sodom, God judged Gomorrah, he also judged Adma, Zebuim, and uh, a small city called Bela or Zoar. They were all caught in the judgment of God. Now, because Sodom is mentioned often, Ezekiel the prophet can be turned to because Ezekiel speaks concerning these cities and their sins. In Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50, he said, This was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant, overfed, and unconcerned they did not help the poor and needy they were haughty and did detestable or disgusting things before me therefore I did away with them as you have seen God gave the root of the sins that are associated with these cities and why they were destroyed the root of the sin was their pride they thought they were the source of their own blessings they weren't thankful Romans 1.21 says, Although they knew God, they didn't glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. God had blessed them, but they monopolized the abundance they had, and they didn't care for others. They had a fullness of food, they had a fullness of abundance, but abundance of idleness, and they had unconcern for the poor. And these are things that God judged. But they also, according to verse 50 of Ezekiel 16, they also were haughty and did detestable things before me. And that's why God says, therefore, I did away with them. What else did they do? What else did they do? What other sin were they guilty of? We're all familiar with it. It was the sin of sexual perversion. It was the sin of homosexuality. You want to change a generation the way a generation thinks? You want to change a society? Do you go after the old people? No. Old people are set in their ways, most people would say. Most older people don't really have an openness to be challenged and to pick up new ways of thinking. So what do you do? Go after the kids. How do you go after the kids? You get them as early as you can. You get them when they're small. You get them in preschool. You get them in kindergarten. You get them in, in elementary school. If you can get them in, in the early formative years of their lives, you can convince them that all kinds of things are right. It becomes their culture. So by the time they're getting older, they have reason to believe because this is the way it's always been. It's always been this way for me as I've grown up. This is what I've adhered to. 
So how do you get to the kids? You destroy families. If you destroy families, then you leave uh, a mom and dad. You just you destroy, uh, uh, take a dad out or a mom out of a family. You destroy the, the, the necessity of having two who can help to form and transform those children's lives through proper education. So what do you do? Well, you give them other things. You give them education, but you give them education for people who don't have morals. And so ultimately what you can do when they're four or five is you can begin to teach them that certain behaviors are okay and that you don't even have to deal with the, the behaviors or beliefs of, of the older people. Just, just concentrate your attention on the younger. Give them reading books that speak about a little girl having two mommies or a little boy having two daddies. Make it very mean-spirited and evil to ever say anything about homosexuality and as if it's wrong. You never want to do that because, after all, that's hateful, isn't it? That's judgmental. That's critical. That's, that's mean. Pass some laws. Pass some laws that say that a man marrying a man is fine or a woman marrying another woman is fine because all it really requires is for you to love one another. And how can you be such a hater? How can you, how can you be so opposed to people's civil rights? And, and that's what you do. You want to cloud it a little bit more, get some contemporary issues and say that it's bigotry. It's a form of bigotry. It's a form of bigotry that, that, that America is, is uh, involved in that causes people to actually be bigoted and overly critical to these poor people. Uh, get some entertainment. Um, have some very appealing talk show hosts who are very much in favor of this lifestyle. It might as well get a lesbian or homosexual to get involved in, in championing the cause. And if you can get the president behind it, all the better. And what do you end up doing? Well, through the education and the culture and the common culture, you take a generation of children and you erase from them any concept of morality. And people don't want to argue about that. So what they do is they, they say, well, we have scientific evidence, even though there has never been a, a gene that has ever been presented as being a quote unquote homosexual gene. So what you say is you just, just basically were born homosexual. You, you even want to change the name from homosexual. You give it something that has a, a more cheery thing, so you call it gay. And what do you do is you get a generation. And the generation doesn't go to church. A lot of people don't go to church. They never hear a pastor or a Sunday school teacher teach on passages of the scripture. They don't talk about Saba and Gomorrah. If they do, they just simply say they were inhospitable cities and God brought judgment because they were inhospitable to the angels. And so you just transform the whole story into something that's current, something that is not true. And you end up with changing a generation, which we have seen take place in our time. Watch a uh, comedy, a TV program on any, any prime time spot. You're going to find a number of very funny families that have homosexuals in it, or offices that have funny homosexuals, because everybody knows that every homosexual is a lot of fun to be around. They've all got great senses of humor, and they'd just be cool to hang with, and that's what has happened in our generation. As simple as I'm making it, I'm simplifying it, obviously. But that's what's happened. That's how you do it. You just get the generation coming up and convince them it's okay. And that has happened here in the United States in my lifetime. In my lifetime. When I was a kid growing up, I knew certain behaviors were wrong and certain behaviors were right. But you know, those behaviors are not being spoken of today. They're actually being, we're actually being told that they're right. And it's outdated. Why do you have these marriage laws anyway? It's wrong for you. Well, they're marriage laws for a reason. You know, a man falls in love with his horse. He can't marry the horse. Why? A man falls in love with his daughter. He can't marry his daughter. Why? You see, what we're doing is we're taking the morality out of marriage. And we're trying to make it some kind of civil right. And in doing so, we have undermined the authority of the family as God created it, one of the three building blocks of all societies. That's what we've done. Now, Noah was a preacher of righteousness, and he was ignored. There are many today in pulpits just like this who are preachers of righteousness, and they are being ignored because people don't want to hear it, because... It, 
wrapped up in the heart of man is rebellion. And when we hear something we don't want to believe or agree with, we simply say, that's your opinion. And we modify it, whatever's being said, so it becomes acceptable to the way we think and what we'd like to believe. When God was speaking concerning Sodom and Gomorrah, it's found in the book of Genesis in chapter 19. He's speaking concerning it in that passage, how that angels had come to spend time in Sodom and and Lot, who was there, saw them and said, no, you can't stay in the streets. It's dangerous at night. Come into my house. It says in Genesis 19, 4 and 5, before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both old and young, all the people from every quarter surrounded the house. And they called to Lot and said to him, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out that we may know them carnally. We want to have relations with them, is what they were saying. It was not in, his, in hospitality that, that Sodom and Gomorrah was judged for. It was for the sins of Sodom, including sexual perversion. In Jude 7, Jude said, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, gone after strange flesh, are set as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Well, you see, there are some who today will say, well, Jesus never even spoke of this sin, and yet you Christians seem to make a big deal over it. Well, Jesus used Sodom as an example. In Mark chapter 6, verses 10 through 12, he said to them, in whatever place you enter a house, stay there till you depart from that place. And whoever will not receive you nor hear you, when you depart from there, shake off the dust under your feet as a testimony against them. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in the day of judgment than for that city so they went out and preached that people should repent. Matthew eleven twenty three and 24, And you, Capernaum, who are exalted to heaven, will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which were done in you were done in Sodom, it would have remained until this day. But I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Luke 17, 28 and 29, Likewise, as it was also in the days of Lot, they ate, they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built. But on the day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. He used Sodom as an example of judgment and by correlating with scripture the sins of Sodom, you know that it included sexual perversion. But what did he do? He delivered somebody from the midst of that. Verse 7, he says, He delivered righteous Lot who was oppressed with the filthy conduct of the wicked for that righteous man dwelling among them tormented his righteous soul from day to day by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. A lot of people today, and I can say this from experience, do not understand the passion of a preacher who wants to preach righteousness. They just don't. What do they say? You're judgmental, you're harsh, you're condemnatory, you're legalistic, you're self-righteous. Lot's heart was pierced by the evil that he saw. The question has to be asked, is ours? Is ours? Is my heart pierced by it? Is my heart pierced by what I see? When I see children being raised to believe that things that God forbids is acceptable. When I see the world that we live in going down the tubes. How, how am I supposed to feel? How are you supposed to feel? It should grieve us. Jesus stood over the city of Jerusalem and wept over it. He wept over it. Not only did he weep over Lazarus, a single individual, but he wept over his cities. He said, you're lost. Judgment's coming. It broke his heart. That's how it should be for us. Not that we shouldn't enjoy our lives. God gives us joy and grace and peace and love and wonderful things, but we ought to have something within our soul that is pierced when we see evil. It ought to cause us in some way or other to, to be willing and open to share what the truth is, to bring people out of the fire to encourage them to know the goodness of God and the grace of God and the love of Jesus Christ and the peace that can be given to you. I wrote something that was published in the Orange County Register a while back now, and an angry homosexual wrote me and, and, and tried to... Um, he told me off is what he did. And I wrote him back. And I said, y you say that you're gay... I said, I have never met more miserable people in my life than homosexuals. You're not gay. You're using a word that used to mean happy, 
to describe a behavior that is causing destruction. You're not gay. You won't be happy until you have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's how you gain that. You don't get it by calling yourself something. They don't understand. They don't believe it. They, they get angry at you. Even the church gets angry. At people like me, they'll get angry at me. It doesn't matter whether the church gets angry at me or not. My job isn't to make people happy. It's to help them become holy. I'm supposed to give the word of God, and if righteous Lot was grieved, I should be grieved. That's how it works. That's how it works. I don't want to become a pastor who is just passive in the sight of in the face of evil, I want to preach a message that will save people from it. I remember a young woman in our fellowship who came and I was teaching a passage that dealt with it, just like I am right now. And she came with her lesbian girlfriend and later on wrote me a letter. A week or two later, I got a letter and she said, I was there, I heard you writing, I heard you um, speaking concerning homosexuality. And I went home with my girlfriend and we began to speak and my girlfriend said, oh, that's his opinion. She said, but I opened the Bible up and I read the passage over again and I looked at the cross references you gave. And she said, David, she goes, the Bible does teach that homosexuality is a sin, that I'm going to receive judgment. She says, I want you to know I gave my heart to Jesus Christ and I've been born again. And then several years later, she moved. She wrote me. She's one of my Facebook friends to this day. And she is married. She has children. She's serving the Lord. See, the truth will set you free. It sets you free. And that's what we're supposed to preach. And there, if, if you cannot go forth weeping, bearing... A uh, precious seed, you will not come again rejoicing, bringing your sheaves with you. There, there needs to be a place of a broken heart, and, and, and righteous Lot's heart was pierced by what he saw. He lived in Sodom, but he never allowed Sodom to live in him. In Psalm 119, 158, it reads, I beheld the transgressors and was grieved because they kept not thy word. God wants to set the captive free. Compromise and preaching with compromise will never set a captive free. It's only the truth that sets somebody free. And God knows how to set you free. It says in verse 9, The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for the day of judgment. Even as Noah, his family, and Lot were delivered, even so those who trust in the Lord will be rescued. Psalm 34, 15 through 19 says, The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are attentive to their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted, saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. God reserves the unjust for their judgment, but he also delivers us out of our temptations, and we have a place that is appointed to us called heaven. Those who have trusted in Jesus have a different destiny. They enjoy fellowship with God. As it says in Psalm 16, 11, you will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That's why truth is so important. Eternity hangs in the balance went into a, an ICU unit. Man was hooked up with all kinds of tubes. He was dying of AIDS. I walked into the room. As I walked into the room there, he looks up at me. His wife is standing next to him. And as I stood next to his bed, I had come to pray for him because he was, he was dying. He motioned to his wife, and his wife gave to him a piece of paper and a pen. He had tubes running down his throat so he couldn't speak. And I'll never forget him with his shaky hand writing on this piece of paper, and he handed it to me. And as I opened and I read 
what he wrote, it simply said this. It said, I am eternally grateful to you. The word eternally came out of that page because he died of AIDS. But he had come to faith in Jesus Christ through our ministry. And he went to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Eternity means something. Eternity means something. When people are on their deathbed, they don't say, I wish I'd have gotten that Porsche. They don't say, I wish I had that bigger house. I've attended more than one person dying, and I can guarantee you they don't have things like that that they say. I wish I'd have spent more time with my family. I wish I'd have loved my wife more. I wish I'd have been a better servant of Jesus Christ is what I've heard. You don't want to enter eternity like that. You want to walk into eternity with joy. There's pleasure awaiting you forevermore. Preachers of righteousness are grieved by sin, but they're overjoyed by the grace of God. We preach the grace of God, but there is sin. You turn from your sin and you turn to your Savior. God knows how to reserve the unjust for punishment, but he also delivers the righteous out of temptation. Trust the Lord. Our Father, we ask that you would work in us today. We ask that by your Holy Spirit you would move amongst us. And even as our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed, perhaps there are some in this room right now that the Spirit is speaking to, you need to get right with God. As our eyes are closed, our heads are bowed. If you need prayer to get right with him, you want to open up to him now. Would you raise your hand? Let me pray for you right where you're at. Father, you see these hands, and you know the reason why they're being raised to you. I ask in Jesus' name that you would reach down and touch these whose hands are raised, and may they enter into fellowship with you. May their sins be forgiven. Wash them and cleanse them. Renew them and use them for your glory. May they be born again. May they become new creations, even as they're opening to you. If they're rededicating, Father, may their life be on the proper track. Now may they move forward in you, that their lives might be a blessing to others and be blessed by you. We thank you and receive by faith from you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. You can put your hands down. And Lord, would you keep moving in us? Do it for your sake and for your glory. In your name, amen. Let's all stand. We'll close with a word of prayer and a last, last comment. Uh, I do hope you're able to be with us tonight, by the way, and Wednesday. But uh, one of the things that the Lord has placed in my heart, you know, is to teach you the truth. I, I gave my heart to Christ this month, 42 years ago. 42 years. 42 years. And I promise you, I was a, a, a liberal, as liberal as a day is long. And what changed me into somebody that thinks, oh, you're such a conservative. What changed me is the word of God, the word of God. So my, my vow and my promise to you is every time you come to this church, I will do my best to give you the best Bible study I can give you that you might know Jesus, the truth that will set you free. That's my promise to you. I will always teach you the word of God. Our Father, we just would come before you now asking that you would work in our hearts and use us for your glory. We leave this place into a field that is so white for harvest. Use us, Lord. May our hearts be grieved by the sin. May we not judge the sinner. May we love them, but may we do the best we can to help them to see you. May we live in such a way that our words will have even more power, Lord, because our lives so often can undermine the message we give. May we live and may we give that which is from you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you.